Well, this video that is going to follow this introduction is from Lucinda Bailey, also known as the Seed Lady. To us, she's just Lucinda and a great, great friend. Um, she's a Texan, um, and her and her business partner, Kurt, run a company called Texas Ready. Probably the best seed banks out there. Granted, I'm a little biased. Um, Lucinda's a good friend of ours, but um, very knowledgeable lady. And that knowledge um, gives me a lot of confidence in her uh, product, and I, I want to share that with you guys. But tag along. This is a long video that follows, so if you um, if you're looking for some kind of entertainment, I would recommend you quickly give me a thumbs down and uh, don't watch this video. But if you want to get some good knowledge and some information, this is the best that I can do um, to bring you her lecture yesterday, a full hour on, um, well, some really great uh, survival gardening um, ideas. And um, I think you'll find it very, uh, very useful and um, very informative. So if you're into some uh, knowledge, and um, if you know Lucinda Bailey, it's well worth watching the hour. So tag along and enjoy the seed lady, my friend Lucinda Bailey from Texas Ready Seeds. How many of you have gardens going now? About 100%, that's fantastic. And how many of you are growing 2,000 pounds of food? Oh. Uh, that is the minimum threshold for survival. Get off to a fast start, and we're glad that everybody here has come because you are going to be survivors and you are going to make it, and your family is going to thrive, not just merely survive. And you're going to have enough to barter with at the end of the day to make it worth all your gardening efforts. How many of you have gardens going now? About 100%. That's fantastic. And how many of you are growing 2,000 pounds of food? Oh, oh, uh, that is the minimum threshold for survival. Did you know that you need a minimum of one million calories for a year's worth of food per person? That breaks down to about 2,700 calories per day. That is not even what the U.S. Army recommends for people under stress. They would like you to have about 3,600 calories. But we can teach you through the Mintlighter Gardening Method, which is survival gardening, how to create that one million calories per person that you need. Now in your hand, you've got some handouts. These are life-saving handouts. Everybody in America needs the two handouts that you have. On one side, you're gonna see how many seeds it actually takes, the three-column chart, how many turnip seeds is it gonna take in order to substantially feed a family of four. Who has that answer? The one that has the three columns, turnips. It says if you're going to do a half a bed of turnips, move on over a couple inches, you're going to see that it requires 180 plants. Does everybody see that? Okay, 180 plants. If it were me, since the seed trays generally come in 50, I would do four trays. Four times 50 is 200. You might have a few seeds that didn't pop up or a weakling here and there or whatever. If you're, if you're really cautious, you would go ahead and do five trays. Give yourself a little buffer. Okay, at the end of the day, you are going to produce how many pounds? There's, there's two numbers that the turnip can throw off. What are those two numbers? Who has that answer? Uh, 360 and 60 pounds is the yield on 180 turnip plants. Do you see that? In the three columns? Do you everybody see that? You're looking at the wrong chart. No? I'm sorry. Wait a minute. Turn that over. Flip it over for me. Okay. In that first column that says you planted 180 oh, turnips. Yeah. You got 60 pounds of turnips at the end of the day. They're about a, a, they're, they weigh about six ounces a piece, okay? But it also says there's a plus 25 to that. What do you think that means? Well, I've given you the answer. Go to your second page, and it's got secondary usages for that plant. And in that column, under turnip, 
it has extra things that you can eat. So leaves would be the secondary item. We're not used to eating turnip leaves, but turnip greens are a southern favorite, to be, to be exact. So here's how you can get maximum production out of your garden just with these two charts. It shows you that turnips are very versatile. You're going to eat the root. That's going to supply 60 pounds. And you're going to eat the turnip greens as you go. That'll supply an extra 25 pounds just from how many plants? 180 plants. You see how that chart works? What about saving the seeds for the next OK, year? that's a good question. That's a really good question. So she's asking a very, um, it's graduate look. Okay, but it's really okay. We're going to take care of that. So in old style gardening, like my grandmother or my parents, they would go ahead and buy seeds every year. That is a waste of money, okay? Because there are, there are two types of seeds. You've got open pollinated kinds of seeds. Those are the kind that you can eat, uh, eat that watermelon, spit the seed out, dry it out, pop it in the ground next spring, and up will come another watermelon. It's the same breed. Everything's lovely. That's an open pollinated seed. That's the kind of survivalist ought to use. If that's been around for 25 years, it's now very stable. We would call that an heirloom seed. So that's a very safe seed for a prepper or a survivalist or someone that believes that the economy might be uh, in danger. Um, to be using. Why don't you go ahead and give this gentleman all the handouts that he's going to need. Thank you. Okay. There are another kind of seed. It's called a hybrid. Now, there's nothing wrong with hybrids. They've been created since the days of Noah when wind would transfer different pollen from plant to plant. There are man-made hybrids. If you have a pink geranium, or you have a red geranium, I have a white geranium, we want to make pink geraniums. I'm going to take some from you, some from me, we're going to mix them together, and boom, we have a pink geranium. That's all lovely. There's nothing wrong with that. But you cannot take the seeds from the pink geranium and expect to get pink geraniums year two. So in an economy that is flourishing, where you have plenty of money to waste on new seeds, or, or the economy is stable enough to make it safe to go to Walmart, Kmart, Lotus, Home Depot, whatever, for the rest of your life, then I am all for growing hybrids. Because actually, hybrids are tougher and better producers than heirlooms. Believe it or not, the strongest part of the male, the strongest part of the female are combined. That becomes a hybrid. And we have that first generation vigor. So I'm all for growing that if we have no problems in our economy. However, that's not where you and I are living. We're living in a, in a situation where the Pope is calling out for one world government one day, when we have Greece falling apart the next. We have people dumpster diving from Sandy after three days. They didn't have enough food stored up. And you and I would do anything to support our family and our children that are crying out for hunger. We don't want to be in that situation. We want to be more prepared. That's why you're at an event like this. That's why you're at a training like this. Okay, so how many methods of gardening are, are there out there? Well, I teach gardening at a junior college, and I can tell you there's at least 40 different methods that if I threw out their names, you wouldn't even know about. Square foot gardening, um, lasagna gardening, on and on and on. I've tried all of those. Okay. Technique. Techniques <laughs> or styles of gardening is what we're referring to. Yes, ma'am. One way I actually read a long time ago about and I actually done right now is tire gardening, where you take an old tire, you stuff with dirt, tomatoes, one of the plants is about that big around at the bottom of this. Okay, that is a style of gardening. Okay, that's what we're talking about. But none of them are as productive as what I'm going to teach you right here. It's the mint lighter gardening method. This has been tried in over 50 countries for 55 years in harsh environments from Siberia to um, Erie and Jaya where it's, it's very, very wet. It's a swamp-like environment. Um, this garden is such an easy system once it gets going that a child can manage it. On this particular cover, you're going to see a little girl peeking behind the garden here. And she is eight years old. And this is the garden that she managed. That's pretty impressive. This is in the desert, by the way. 
This picture is also from the desert. So the fact that we're in Lubbock with plenty of wind and plenty of obstacles is not a problem for this survival method of gardening. Now you do have a wind issue. So you're going to have to either do wind breaks or you're going to have to have an indoor way to grow like the shown in this um, little nursery just around the corner. There's going to have to be some protection for the young and tender plants, absolutely. All right, let me just say this. Last night I went out to a wonderful restaurant steakhouse here in Lubbock. It was great. Okay. So I'm sure that you have done similar things in your lifetime. We don't think too much as Americans that are flush with cash at the moment to wasteful use, extraneous use of extra money. But I would, I would just say that if we're preparing, we're going to need to have the resources if the internet goes away, when it goes away. Let's just be realistic. If the internet goes away, we're going to need to have a closet full of the right kind of books to make it through. Now, I've made it a little bit easy for you. We're going to pass out these pamphlets. I've got my assistant right here. April assistant, ready to go. And in there is a list of some, some books that you need as a prepared individual to have in your library. Now, there, there have been some changes. I printed 100,000 brochures, and boom, then all of a sudden these books go out of print. It's pretty crazy. First book is out of print. So in substitute of that, this is the next best thing. So if you are taking notes, you might want to write this down. The Vegetable Gardener's Bible. The Vegetable Gardener's Bible. It, it supplants item number one on this sheet. Okay, I sell it at the table, it's 20 bucks. Okay, the next book, who has heard of the next book? Anybody heard of square foot gardening? It's the most popular method. Of, it's certainly been well promoted. Now, this gentleman took lessons from Jacob Mitleider, the author of this system. I've done that one. Okay, I think, how many have done this method? Okay, I have two. And while he was an architect and he has beautiful ways of setting the raised bed up and constructing your garden, and he's very successful at getting people's butts off the couch and into the backyard for the first time, and that is a value, by the way. And he does have a good appendix. That's why I have the book available for sale. It is not good dirt science. He skipped out on those lessons, and he should have stayed in class under Jacob Mitleider's method. Okay. All right, the next book is um, The Backyard Homestead. And this is actually how I got into prepping. Actually, I knew a little bit about prepping because I was a stockbroker and uh, then I was a real estate broker and a loan officer. So I, I owned all these things that were like shooting your foot off. Boom, boom. You know what I mean? Industries that were failing. Okay. And uh, so I was a little bitter. And uh, my normalcy bias, y'all know what normalcy bias is, right? Okay, it's where you believe that the way that you've enjoyed your life thus far is the way it will forever continue. And you're not willing to change and face reality. Well, I lived there for many years. It's very nice down in my little rabbit hole. But when I popped my head out, I, I came across this Barnes & Noble book, back here, and on the back of this, it said that on a quarter acre subdivision lot, you could grow 1,400 eggs. I didn't know anything about chickens at the time and 2,000 pounds of vegetables. I knew she was lying. So I said, I'm gonna take it upon myself to prove that she's a liar and get her off the market. Because this is just, people should not be, you know, what I put her principles to effect, and voila, she was a liar on the low side. You can grow many more than 2,000 pounds on your backyard. And this is the system to do it in, okay? And that chart that you have in your hand that tells you, listen, as a matter of fact, go through that chart. Okay. The chart says garden planting details for the midlighter system. Okay? So let's suppose you're going to do beans. Well, beans come in two kinds. What does it say on the chart? What kind of beans do we have? Two kinds of beans. We've got bush beans and we've got pole beans. They react completely different. Bush beans are fabulous to can with because their harvest comes due in a very short period of time and you can bring your little canning machines and all that out and you're going to have a bushel of stuff to work with. The pole beans on the other hand um, grow up and they stay up and they produce for a long period of time. Pole beans, 
Okay? Now, interestingly enough, you're going to put your bush beans how far apart? In the spacing column, in the middle of the chart, it says that those bush beans, you plant them three inches apart. You plant your pole beans how far apart? Two inches. Two inches. Because they're going to go up, they're going to get most of their new photosynthesis done vertically. They're not going to be taking up a lot of room in your garden. All right. You're going to be putting them half an inch in the soil as the soil depth. Under bush beans, you can get 68 pounds after planting 240 plants. You all see that? Now, how many weeks do you fertilize? Because that is a shorter term plant than your pole bean, you're going to fertilize it less. So five to six applications of fertilizer. Well, what kind of fertilizer? Oh, that's another question, but I'm going to show you how to do it. All right. A human being needs about a hundred different elements to be a perfectly composed, non-ill person. Plants need 17 elements. Plant scientists have figured this out for 50 years. This is not new to them. Ace Hardware used to sell elements, sulfur, sometimes magnesium sulfate. You can still find Epsom salts, which magnesium sulfate is, but zinc, which is a trace element that's required, um, manganese, these are all needed in mining quantities, okay? As a matter of fact, you need boron, which is an essential element for plant health. Without boron, you are going to have nothing happening in your fruit. Mm -hmm. You're going to have, have you ever heard of blossom and rot on tomatoes? It's a black spot that will destroy all your tomatoes. If you do not have two parts per million in boron, no, no harvest. Okay. I don't know if your soil here has it, nor do you, nor does that mean. Because you're not going to be able to take soil samples and send them off to A&M and get them evaluated and bought off as the fan. So it's better to say these 17 elements, we know how much they should be, we know what proportion, we just ought to stockpile them. You're stockpiling plenty of tuna cans, you're stockpiling plenty of bullets, why wouldn't we get all the nutrition that our plants and gardens are going to need so that our families can be welcome. That's what I'm doing. No one's going to jump your fence and steal your crops. Um, yeah, I was wondering, um, are, are all the uh, compounds that you're talking about shelf stable? Yes, absolutely. That's the other beauty of it. Now, where I live, I live in an extremely humid environment, Houston. And so I need to add a little bit of vermiculite that is a water absorber. It's like a sponge contracts and whatever expands and I add that to my fertilizers so they don't clump up. Here I think you're going to be quite okay. Now page 53 of this particular book teaches you the recipe. Don't worry, you can't get this stuff anymore thanks to, what was that town? West? Blew out of the sky, ammonia nitrate factory. Ooh. You remember? Well other things. Okay here's the recipe. This recipe works. But you cannot. You are not as a consumer, thanks to the EPA and blah, 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 we're going to be able to get this stuff. So I've done it. We've got it for you. Okay? These come in two, pa two 10 ounce packets per, per $15 trace element bag. You're going to go to Lowe's Home Depot, your typical nursery provider, and get NPK. What's NPK? Nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. Okay. Everybody that does a lawn knows NPK, right? You're going to get it in a 50 pound bag, 40 pound bag, a big quantity. You're going to buy two five gallon paint buckets with lids. So now that's $10 of plastic that you're going to buy. You're going to get your fertilizer. You're going to take 25 pounds of it and pop it into one of the five gallon buckets. You would then get four pounds of magnesium sulfate. And what's magnesium sulfate? Epsom salts. You can get that at Lowe's, Costco, Kroger's, whatever. And you're going to take one 10 ounce packet of this, pop it in there, do a little stirring, not much, and that is the fertilizer that you are then going to use and you're going to make those applications that are discussed here. Is that, you see how that works? Okay. Now me, I'm planning on seven to ten years of crap happening of a society that would not be stable. And I am saving up 10 years of fertilizer for that issue, for my garden space. A family of four would need two of these packets per year, $30 of trace elements and 
probably $50 of NPK. So for less than $100 per year, you can provide your plants with everything that they need. And it does, this system is so beautiful for survivalists because it'll grow in any soil. We do not care what your soil is. Now I was an organic gardener. I teach organic gardeners. I taught them how to double their tomato production one year at their state convention. They like me. But I have realized that it takes seven to ten years to fix your dirt to make it completely suitable for organic gardening. We don't have that much time. Nor do we have the skill set to make compost. Have you ever made compost? Yeah, I've actually made it. Okay, so you start off with six feet of brush, greens, browns, layers, lasagna, rats coming, snakes, excitement. And it dwindles down, because it's deteriorating chemically, to about six inches. That will refresh one bed. That will not feed a family of four for that one bed. In order to feed a family of four, you need to compost a room this size every year. That's not possible. So what I've done is I've trained you, I've, I've gotten to the system where this beats a whole lot of composting action. Okay, and it, get, it delivers this so that the plant can immediately use it versus the six to 18 months that it takes for the plants to utilize composting material. Grab a chair. They're going for it. But you can come on up and walk, walk up and pick these sheets up for these guys. All right. So this system is the way to go if you are a survival gardener. Is, is that, uh, what you talked about, the 10 ounces of that, the Epsom salt, is that in that book? That is in the book. And it's also in here. Okay? Actually, I've simplified page 53 is where that um, recipe is. I've completely simplified that. So it's three steps, three products. The NPK, the Epsom salts, and the trace elements in a 25, uh, in, in a five gallon. Is that, is that written down in that book, that NPK? And Page 53 has the 17 elements, but what I just said is not. It is right here on this sheet. Because, see, what happened is, although I have known that this is what survival gardeners ought to be growing, I began to get phone calls from my customers saying, I can't find sulfur, I can't find manganese, I can't find zinc. So I went into the fertilizer business. I have a master's degree in fertilizer. Not what I thought I'd grow up to be, I promise you. Okay? But for the patriots, and I want them to make it for what's coming, I went ahead and did the studies. Okay? And believe me, I flunked kind of chemistry when I was in college. Did, did that. One thing I noticed that works really well, lot in milk. Tomatoes. Okay, if, if you are milk. growing 2,000 pounds of food, then we're going to listen. Yeah. Until you're growing 2,000 pounds of food, we're probably going to say we want a repeatable experiment with demonstrable scientific results. Now what she's saying is that rotten milk works. It does work because it's got calcium. Calcium drives every single chemical transaction in gardening. If you have lack of calcium, nothing's going to happen. Your photosynthesis is not going to happen. Your fruiting's not going to happen. Your seed production won't happen. So, but there's other things that are missing out of that. I would call that Uncle Joe's sage mythology, uh, mythical advice for gardening. And Uncle, you know what I'm saying? Because it's non-repeatable. Okay. But, it's, but what I'm teaching is 50 years, or 55 years, 50 countries. It's a repeatable production system. Okay. Because if she's she's doing her calcium just beautifully, but she's missing that two parts per million boron, she's not going to get the fruiting that she should have. So what I'm teaching is a complete system. If you are a scientist or you're an engineer, you are going to love this system. All right. Thank you so much. And she's going to earn herself a free mint lighter book because of your service to our community. So anyway, I'm just saying that as I, as I pre uh, prepared this person, all of us in this room have plenty of guns and bullets. But after that, we got to eat. And that's where we have a weak link in our chain. And so if you can become a person that really knows this system, as is explained on these two sheets, which you guys have, right? 
then you are going to become the rocket scientist of the new economy. And your family's going to be okay. And you're going to have plenty of food to barter with. Now, I know a few of my friends are growing tomatoes. I'm going to discuss tomatoes. I'm going to teach you how to get the maximum amount of production out of your tomatoes. There are two types of tomatoes. Three, actually. But, but determinant are the bush-style tomatoes. And, and you will see on your little tag on most uh, of the nurseries right now, whether it's a determinant or an indeterminate. If you like to can, you're going to want a determinant variety. Because everything's going to come due in a determined period of time. You can bring out those giant you know, things and do your canning and all that effort and know that you've got a bushel of tomatoes to play with. But if you just have three or four tomatoes, it isn't so attractive to bring all that stuff out and get the fire all cooked up. So you would be wanting to have salads all summer, right? That's an indeterminate kind of tomato. That's the old Italian kind of tomato. That's the kind of vining tomato. This is what we're going to talk about. You don't do hardly any pruning on the bush or the determinate type of tomatoes. They can be staked up. You can use those little three-tier tomato cages. Everything is wonderful. But on an indeterminate, wild-haired, crazy tomato, you cannot use steaks. You cannot use tomato cages. They will fall over because they just go nuts. Now I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I have friends that call me and go, "Oh, I have a nine-foot tomato," and I said, "Well, do you have any tomatoes?" Because they really have a tomato tree. They do not have production. I am not in the business of growing a giant tomato bush. I, I will care less. So there is severe pruning that must happen in order to have a productive situation. Now, this guy knows how to grow. Mitlider knows how to grow. He grows his tomatoes vertically. What convinced me as a teacher who has taught for 30 years gardening, 40 different methods that this might be attractive for survivalists was I went into a friend's garden who'd been an organic gardener so I didn't know what she was talking about. Come and see my garden. I saw a tomato at about two foot, four inches higher I saw another tomato, four inches higher another tomato, all the way up the stalk. I had never seen a tomato like that. But then I said, well that could be a fluke until I looked at her row of 20 plants, every one of them doing the same little thing. I'm going, I think I need to learn how to prune like she does. And so this book will teach you how to prune for maximum production. So you don't grow tomato bushes anymore, but you actually get tomatoes. Now the same thing with cucumbers and squash and melons. You can all prune them so that you can get maximum production. Watermelons are a little bit kind of wild. Here's the secret on watermelon pruning. As soon as you see a watermelon, go forward on the vine one more inch, cut them. One watermelon per month. So the very first watermelon, go one inch farther, cut it, you're done. That watermelon will produce three to five watermelons if you do it that way. And they'll all grow, they'll double in size basically. Instead of getting a 20 pound watermelon, you might get a 40 pound okay? Watermelons are just all over the place. But with your cucumber, squash, and regular cantaloupe, and so forth, what you do is you train them to go vertically. And they're gonna want to go like an octopus every which way. You're not gonna allow it. They go out and they make, make one, an additional cucumber to the right, cut it off, an additional cucumber to the left, cut it off. And then you're just going to have layers and layers of straight cucumbers coming down off of a vine that you have done vertically. By growing vertically, you are increasing your production at least three to four times. And it's so much e So in your space, you're maximizing your space to go vertical. Right? Okay. So that's pretty cool. All right. So now there are two methods of gardening. We've discussed it a little bit already. You can either fix the dirt, it takes seven to 10 years, and around here it might take 10, or you can feed the plant. I'm all about feeding the plant because I know exactly what my plants need. That chart that you have, does everybody have a chart? 
It tells you exactly how many feedings per plant. We've been through this, but we have some new people, so indulge us a little. Okay, so if you were doing an indeterminate tomato, then you're going to space it how far apart? The chart shows you. You're going to put it nine inches apart. But if you have a bush style tomato, which is a determinant, I saw you taking those notes, you're going to put it 14 inches apart. And a bush style is going to be six to eight applications of fertilizer. Okay? We're demonstrating that wonderful chart I gave you guys to the newbies. Okay? But if you do a indeterminate, then you're going to give it a little bit more fertilizer. Indeterminate gets six to eight, and a bush gets five to six applications of fertilizer. Okay. So now how many of you have your seed banks already? Do you know what a seed bank is? You bought one. I remember you. Yes, you have a seed bank. Okay. They last four to six years, according to the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Some of those survivalist magazines are saying 25. Some liars are saying 50. Do not believe those figures. They're too good to be true. 40 degrees is the temperature that you should be storing them. But it's possible that you've got an air-conditioned pantry, you don't have an extra refrigerator to put this in, whatever. So the maximum temperature that you should allow your seeds to get is air-conditioned environment, closet, pantry, floor, and so forth. Okay? So now let's suppose it all hits the fan and you don't have electricity anymore. That could happen. People are talking about that. What do you do? You're going to dig a hole in the ground 24 inches deep. You're going to have a cooler. You're going to pop it in. It's going to be 68 degrees. Okay, so that would be the way to do it. A lot of the old timers used to have houses that had um, oh, well, a pure beam. They would put it under there. Okay? All right. So we have some extra people here that need survival charts. And so you can help them out. Perfect. Thank you so much. All right. So the goal here is that you're going to grow at least how many calories per person per year? It's an overwhelming figure. It's amazing. How many do we need? Oh, okay. One million calories per person must be grown per year. <coughs> it takes to be a good gardener under normal methods of gardening three years to become a good gardener. I hope you have a lot of dehydrated food saved up if you use the I'm going to fix the dirt method. Okay? Really, seriously. But the method that we're going to use, you will be a successful gardener the first year. It's an easy system. An eight-year-old managed this garden. Okay? It tells you whether to go. You know, I like the order and precision of the boxes, the raised beds. But if I don't have kind of the money or I don't have the supplies stored up like I should have, you can do this method director. It's done direct dirt in most of the world. So this is the beauty of this system. Okay. So we talked about the books that your family is going to need. And in this sheet is a list of those books. I'm going to talk to you about a couple more books that you're absolutely going to need and some, some reasons that you need it. How many of you own this book? Seed to Seed. Once you grow that good garden and you get the produce, we're going to want to keep our seeds from becoming hybridized because a little bee flying t five miles away can bring squash pollen from a hybrid and mate with your beautiful heirloom. You won't even know that dastardly deed has been done. Next year, what are the results of that hybridized pollen from your squash plant that you diligently thought as an heirloom? What's going to happen are three potential outcomes of hybrids. 50% of those future seeds could be sterile. I don't know if that breeding is going to make sterility, nor do you. A, third, a second thing that could happen is it could mutate into a lovely but very tough and inedible gourd. That would not be pretty. Like a genetic default, right? Or it could revert up the genetic chain and you don't know what that's going to look like, and you don't know what great-grandparent is going to be produced in your garden. It is too risky for a prepper to rely on my seeds becoming hybrids. 
How do you prevent that? The beauty is that this book, there are methods of preventing that. Our great grandparents didn't have to worry about that, but with genetic modification and hybridization as being the main way that people are growing with seeds, Lowe's, Home Depot, feed stores, Walmart, that's what they generally sell, are hybrids. And if we had a stable economy, again, I wouldn't care, but that is not where we live. So, you're going to get this book. It is a $25 book that today I'm going to sell for $20. And on page 98, it's going to show you what you're going to do. On three of your nice plants, you're going to do the following. You're going to identify the male flower, identify the female flower, get a piece of masking tape and tape them up. Then what you're going to do is, they're only available for mating three hours. You're going to watch your other garden plants and see what's going on and say, well, I think they're ready. And you're going to use the male. You're going to strip the, the petals off. He's going to look like a Q-tip. Oh, well. And then you're going to go ahead and ma uh, self manipulate the pollen onto the female. You're going to tape her back up because those bees are very tricky. The minute your back is turned in 15 minutes or less, Mrs. Murphy's crazy bee with Air, uh, hybrid pollen is into your garden messing things up. No, right away you're going to use masking tape and mask that particular blossom up. So now you're going to identify that with a yellow ribbon. When mama says, Jerry, go get zucchini, she does not mean the one that you're needing for feeds for food stock next year, right? You only need to do the uh, no, glassy up. In addition to the gardening, we now have this to deal with. Yes, you do. Okay? It's nice to know this before, you know, it all hits the pain, right? You guys are going to make it year two, three, four, five, while your neighbor has hybridized stuff, sterile seeds, wonders why they wasted 16 square feet of their garden devoted to sterile, yeah, no, you're going to have productivity. You only need to do this on three or four plants to gather your seed. But don't do as I did and do a straight little line of the stuff and make a Bambi buffet. Yeah, I had, uh, that was the day that the deer jumped over and ate all my plants. So at least be smarter than I was. Risk management. We're survivalists, we're preppers, we know these things. So you scatter this a little bit, okay? You're going to take 50 seeds from this one, 50 seeds from this one, 50 seeds from that one. Why wouldn't you take 400 seeds from one spaghetti squash? You want some genetic diversity. Okay? So we got to think these things. I know. I didn't grow up thinking I wanted to do this for my life. But this is the time that God has us in history. It's a, admittedly a difficult time. Yes, I'd rather be on a cruise too. I would. But here we are. For such a time as this, we are here. And we're going to stand and deliver. And we're going to overcome the evil by an act of love, obedience, and discipline. And that's called gardening. We are going to have food for the shirt tail relatives, our neighbors, our church members, and so forth. You know what the definition of a shirt tail relative is, right? Oh, yes, they ride in your coattails. Okay, a shirt tail relative. Voted for Obama not once but twice. Are doing zero preparations. They roll their eyes at us at every Thanksgiving and Christmas, but they will be the first to the ranch. Now, do you have any of those in your, your family? Because I have them. So what I'm going to do is gather seeds to take care of them. If you're not going to shoot them on the front porch, then you better have the seeds in your closet. Because if you have enough seeds in your seed bank for a family of four, but you're letting 12 of your shirt tail relatives in, all 16 of you can starve equally. That's really the reality. You have to think like that. So how many people, how do you buy a seed bank? You buy it based on who are you going to be responsible to feed. Now, I believe in, in charity and things like that. So I always have a 10% factor for mercy and gifts, you know, anything I do. So I always, I built this into the seed bank. We've got regional-based seeds, 80 varieties. Now, I'm, my family's crazy. They don't like okra. I don't know what's wrong with them. Whatever. And there's something that your family doesn't like. The bushes don't like broccoli. I don't know what it is that you guys don't like. I've got 80 varieties in here, so you will have enough nutrition to make it through without rickets, scurvy, and a host of other nasty diseases. 
and so forth. And these are seeds that will work in the south. They're heat resistant, drought tolerant. They're not like what they sell at Lowe's or Home Depot. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you what, what you guys have access to. I hate to break the news to you, but you have access to class B seeds. I get class A, I'm a farmer. Now, because I, I know about arbitration. If I don't get the germination that I need in my field, I am not spending $25,000 on beans that don't pop up and germinate. I'm going to win that in an arbitration hearing. So my seed supplier, knowing that, does not give me crap B or C level seeds. But that's what's available. After the farmers buy their seed, then the seed manufacturers go and do the Walmart packets, the Lowe's packets, and so forth. I hate to tell you that. But that's the reality. Has anybody bought a packet of corn that planted $2.27 and nothing happened? We've all had that happen. But you're not going to sue them for $2.27, I'm sure. But $27,000, I will uh, you know, make it happen. Anyway, so I get better seeds, I buy it in bulk, and then I break it down for you guys. So that is one of the benefits of working with Texas Red. Now, do you dye your seeds? I know the These are, okay, there are huge amounts of fungus right now in, in the south. It's about a seven year cycle. And these are, this is a pre-emergent herbicide. A millionth of a part of a million, whatever, is on here to help that seed make it through its early development and, and uh, overcome the fungus that is naturally in the soil that you can't even see and won't know that's there. And there are the seed sellers do not even sell me the seeds without that on there because they don't want me to come back and say, hey, your stuff didn't grow up, when it's so easy to do that. So yes, I pay a little extra to get that so that you guys can have a benefit as you plant your gardens and more success. Now the next generation of seeds, of course, it won't have that on Okay? All right. Although I can teach you how to do that at a you know, family level, how to, how to inoculate your own seeds. But that's for another day. So in that pamphlet, this was book number four. This is essential. You can be the best gardener. You can have a master's degree in agronomy, but if you do not know how to save seeds, don't fool yourself, you're a short term and that means you're gonna last two years. I want you to last longer. That's why I'm here, that's why you can, for 20 bucks, put this in your hands. Okay, if you must grow organically, and I grow naturally, but I do not grow organically because blood meal, bone meal, those are actually Part of the reason why mad cow's disease is around. Mad cow's disease is because the cows ate animal product. They ate their own fellow dead cows, ground up. That's how mad cow's disease starts. Now, I am not putting animal products, although plenty of organic people do, is a very good source of nitrogen. I'm not arguing. I just have a better source of nitrogen, a safer source of nitrogen. Nice little tidbit for you all to know, right? Okay, um, so if you must grow organically and you want to spend the 10 years it's going to take to fix the dirt in, in this area, this is a wonderful book. It's a classic. So, by all means, avail yourself of it. I'm not opposed to fixing dirt, but I know it takes a long time to do, and it takes a lot of compost. Remember, Family Four is going to take a shipping container the size of this room per year to compost properly and have enough to refresh your dirt. That's too much work in my economy. I'm gonna, I'm gonna fit, I desire efficiency. I desire not cheap, but I desire good value. And I don't think that composting is a, is a good, good effort on your part. If you have an orchard, you're gonna want to know how to do it properly, trim it, and so forth. By proper pruning, you can maximize the size and the, and the quantity of your fruit. And, and so I would recommend this book. Um, so you guys absolutely need a seed bank before the day is out. You need to, seeds are very tough to find right now. And I can tell you there's lots of seed shortages. And when it all hits the fan and the internet goes away, and I'm in my bunker, I'm not in my bunker, but I'm, I'm bugged out. You might want to go to your drawer and pull this out, but I will be nowhere to be found, as will my fellow <laughs> competitors. Does that make sense? How long does the seeds last? How long does the seeds last? Good question. 
The time to buy seeds is not when it, the event hits. The time to buy seeds is to have them. Even if you're not going to start your garden and begin your practice, which I think is foolish, I think you should be practicing, you better have that resource available. When the thief comes, is that's not the time to be going to a gun show and getting your bullets. Okay, so how long do the seeds last? Good question. You're going to find lots of answers out there. Now, I went to the U.S. Department of Agriculture for seed saving knowledge and training. That's in Fort Collins. These people are professionals. They know the heck what they're doing. Their answer was four to six years if you properly store it in the temperature range, which was what? 40 degrees to air conditioned environment. That window. Heat is an enemy to longevity. You can put it in the old refrigerator, the cranky one that you put the beer in the party room. <laughs> Got it. That's what we want. That's right. Now, um, excess moisture is also an enemy. So baby food jars in the future for your own personal save seeds, or I have this stuff in medical grade packaging. You do not want to do, as many of my competitors are, suck all the oxygen out, vacuum pack the stuff. Absolutely not for seeds. Good for food, not good for living seeds. These are living organisms. They're in dormancy. They need a little oxygen transfer. There's plenty of it. Even when this thing is shut, there's a little bit of, of um, oxygen being transferred, enough to keep them in dormancy and alive. So four to six years is, is the answer to that. So if you bought, if you were a preparedness person like I was for 15 years, you have probably either planted those tomato seeds and harvested fresh seeds, the clock starts ticking at that point, or you've bought a separate kit. So if you've got a three-year-old, four-year-old kit, you might want to be holding it out, checking it out. But most of you in the room do not have your kit yet. Would I be safe to say that that's correct? But you are concerned, your eyes are open, it wasn't a good week, the Pope declares he wants a one-world government, uh, Greece isn't looking so good, Stuff can happen, right? J Helm, on and on and on. I don't know why you're here. But you're wanting to make it. And because of that, you're going to need, as one of your main items, a food production system. My people perish for lack of knowledge. I've heard that verse. Mm -hmm. It's true. I've tried 40 methods of gardening. This is the one I would recommend for survival. Okay? We can argue about the finer points of lots of different methods of gardening. But if you want to have the most production and a predictable amount of production, you're going to want this book, $20 book. I was, I was saying earlier, I waste a lot of money. I wasted 50 bucks on a wonderful state. Well, 25 of that was wasted. But you know, I, I know I have to have certain tools on my shelf ready to pull out in case I absolutely need them. So you need to have the knowledge, the working knowledge, you need to have the practice. Everybody ought to have some practice gardening, even if it's container gardening. Okay, what we're going to do, we kind of did an overview of the basics that you're going to need, and we gave you a little encouragement to get your seed saving book. These are the two books, and you only can buy two books at this event. This is what you need. How to grow it properly, how to save seeds. But really, I think you ought to do more. It's late in the game. I tell you, it's late in the game. you got to get your seeds. So buy your seeds according to the region that you're in. Buy it with someone that can you can pick up the phone and call in case you run into a gardening glitch, and you will run into a gardening glitch. Is this book, is, is this bug good? Is this whatever? 97% of the bugs are good, but you might you might have that squash bug out there. Oh, I had a squash bug. She's had squash bug. Haven't we all? And I'm in the dirt, just so you know, I have 27 acres. I have cows, I've got the chickens, I've got the rat. I, I'm doing it, I'm living, I won't say it's the dream, I'm, but I'm living the life that you guys will fall into should the economy go up. Yes, ma'am? My other question is, you know, there's a lot of humans on this planet and when the shit hits the fan, it's going to be all over the place and you're not going to be able to be, be, able to be one of the location takes for a long period of time to guard. What do you recommend for uh, wild food? You know, local wild foods okay. survive until you're able to settle down, kill things. All right, that is a good question. It's called wild crafting, wild for foraging. Those are not effective ways of providing for a family of four. 
because while there are some interesting books out there, and you should not get one book, you should get three books, all with color photographs, because for every edible, there is a inedible that will poison you. I promise you, it's not pretty. And those berries are only good for maybe three weeks. If you're not waltzing through, then you are going to be very hungry. You should never plan for wild crafting to support you more than three days in a row. You know, we can live three days without water, maybe 30 days. After three weeks, you're virtually useless. So let's just say you can live three weeks without eating. Okay? I don't want you to have to go through any of that. That means gums, bullets, water, then you're going to have to have a food dehydrated while you're getting your garden in. In 28 days, I can get you to eat radishes and lettuces. That ain't much, guys. I know that. So the plan is, let's start practicing now. On a tenth of an acre, you should be able to produce 4,000 pounds of food. That's amazing. But God has set it up that all of us can be food self-sufficient. Genesis 2.10, 2.8, something like that. It says, I gave you the seed. Didn't give Monsanto, ConAgra, Bayer the seed. He gave us the seed. That means he gave us the food responsibility. And then he's going to empower us to complete that. He doesn't give us a responsibility without the ability to do it. So I know that God's given you and me the ability to do it. Right now it's a little more convenient to go to HEB. I got that. But if that went away, just, re just remember and be confident that you can do it for your own family. If you have the right resources, a seed bank. Right for the seed. How much are the seeds? The seeds are, depending on the size group that you got to feed, what is it going to take in today's dollar at Kroger's to feed that group? Family of four, it's going to cost $800 a month to feed. So for one week's worth of today's Kroger dollars, you can buy all the seeds necessary to take care of your family next year, the year following, and the rest of their life. That's a pretty good return on investment. And I assure you, my 401k does not do such things. So $200. $200, right. So one week's worth of food is what the cost. Family of six is going to spend $1,500 a month in food. I used to run a restaurant. 30 people is $5,000 in food cost. And then you break it down, it's $1,000. One week's worth of food cost. And all those prices are here. Now, the interesting thing about this is I think we're the only company that has an animal-proof container. PVC, rats can eat through. Um, raccoons can open up many of these containers. The number 10 cans, definitely. Pyrex or whatever, what, those plastic tubs. Forget it. A rat can eat through that for 10 minutes. Anyway. Ammo cans are fantastic because it's a grab-and-go situation. The other thing is, I know you guys don't like to do this, is, is I have a system. So when we're doing, um, let's say, Brussels sprouts, I have seeds broken out into three capsules. So year one, because many of these, half the, half the plants on your list here, the 80, don't even produce seeds for two years. Okay, so you're going to plant the stuff in the cabbage family, for example, does not even throw off seeds for two years. So you would plant year one, that's one of these capsules. I've already counted the seeds out, guys. I'm really helping you out. You plant year one. Then year two, you're going to eat 90% of year one food. You're going to let 10% of that stuff go to seed, right? Mm -hmm. While that's doing its seed growing business, you plant capsule number two. But you always have capsule number three as a good farmer, some stuff in reserve, right? So that's how I've broken it out. So you don't have to get your tweezers out and go through that nonsense. I've done it for you. I'm thinking of you. I know how you are. Does that make sense? Okay, so cabbage, because I noticed that one sagebrush that I planted last year, my garden didn't do well last year. The sagebrush survived and it's still growing. What she's saying is that some of her plants are living longer than one year, and that's fantastic. Or potentially they're growing back. Those would be perennials. A lot of your herbs will do stuff like that, and that is very, very cool. But out of the 80 vegetables, maybe only 
5% are perennials, okay? Your nursery is a perennial, things like that. Your sweet potato is a perennial. So you got lucky, okay? But that's not how you get your squash back, that's not how you get your tomatoes back, and so forth. Yeah? Wait, wait, I'll just put in a bunch of sweet potatoes this year, and they're just doing nuts. They're doing nuts, okay? And what did you fertilize them with? Compost. He did compost. And so what's in that compost? How much magnesium is in that compost? He doesn't know. Nobody knows what's in the compost. And could he repeat the exact recipe? Let's suppose the sweet potatoes did fantastic with the compost. Could he repeat that exact recipe? So year two, three, four? No, because you don't know from one compost recipe to the next what is actually in there. And if you do not have two, per, two parts per million boron in there, you probably are going to have deficient uh, tubers. Two parts per million isn't a lot of boron, but four parts per million is toxic to the plant. So these are very, very tight parameters on the 17 essential elements. And that's why this, this fertilizer mix is a big help to people. You all see how this could be a big time savings and money savings? Because you don't need to buy 10 or 12 pounds of zinc. And they don't sell it in any smaller quantity when all you need over the life of seven years of gardening is maybe one cup of zinc. I've taken, I've broken it out for you. I beat, buy the big 500 pound whatevers and I break it out. You got 10 ounces to mix with what? 25 pounds of NPK, which you buy at Lowe's or Home Depot. So all the heavy stuff you buy local, Put it into your five gallon buckets and mix it up. It could not be an easier system. But remember, these gardens were managed by an eight year old. Now she didn't build the boxes, but she did manage it. Meaning she did the fertilization out of the five gallon buckets using a chart just like you and feeding those plants. It's an easy, no fail, repeatable, scientifically demonstrable system in any any climate and any soil. It's perfect. If you did have to go from point A to Colorado, you don't have to change all your dirt knowledge. You are feeding the plant properly with this for life. Does that make sense? Yeah. Great. Do you sell that separately? I do sell this separately. It's two packets, two 10 ounces, $15. If you mix that with 50 pounds of fertilizer that you buy from, from your store, that will take care of the garden, half a garden. It will produce 2,000 pounds of food. Those of you who have just come in, do you all have the charts where it shows you? At the bottom, how many pounds does it tell you that you can produce? That bottom line. Somebody read that. And tell me how many pounds am I teaching you to produce out of your backyard? 4,285 pounds. That will feed a family in four. Okay, there's no other garden system that predicts it like this, that goes out on a limb that says, if you do this behavior, you will get guaranteed this result. That's pretty phenomenal. Okay, so out of 40 different kinds of gardening methods, I do not recommend anything better than knit lighter gardening. It's the survival gardening strategy. Does anybody have any garden issues, garden questions, garden successes? Yes, ma'am. This is just for organic uh, bad bug repellents. Okay, you can make several bug repellents, and I do believe in bug repellents, okay? But you can make your own, okay? You can get a, um, get some chew. I don't know how much it costs, maybe five bucks, a little can of chew. Take one tablespoon, put it into three quarts of water. Tobacco, loose tobacco. Boil it. Go ahead and put it in a spritz bottle. Spritz it on those bad bugs. It will kill them. Tobacco is a very powerful bug repellent. With water? Yeah, three quarts of water. Huh. Boil it for about 10, 15 minutes. Strain it so it doesn't gum up your little spritzer, but that is a very effective thing that a, a prepper can do. Doesn't have to go to Lowe's. A, can, a, can, of a can of snuff. A one tablespoon to three quarts of water. Three quarts. Yes. Okay. So, any other garden questions? Yes. Uh, my, my stuff's in the going. 
subject line. What's that? Right. He had, I've already got all of this come up at the right where the line broke. I mean, he's got a mass of that is absolutely Right, so some tomato seeds that were digested by some humans in his family came out of the septic system and voila, they're volunteering. Would I eat those tomatoes? Yes, I would eat them. Because I can tell you that when the manure breaks down chemically, it becomes completely different stuff than a stuff. Okay. The mine used human uh, fecal matter in the Aztecs like to use that in their gardens. They had some pretty good gardens according to Spanish. Any other garden issues, garden questions? For this? Oh, group. Are you guys gardening with the Texas Ready to Stop yet? Are you guys using the seeds? Well, they are using they aren't using the seeds yet. A packed away. Okay. Three to or four to six years is what we're saying, right? Yeah. So if you put away some air like at like the heirloom seeds you buy like this, will they last four to six years? If you bought okay. if anybody's seeds are gonna last four to six years if you properly store them in the temperature range of forty degrees all the way to air conditioned pantry. Forty degrees is preferable. Do not believe the people that are saying, Oh, freeze them. Well you can't freeze certain seeds, peas, beans, corn, hard shell seeds, but dill, radishes, other things. Don't respond so well to the cold. This is a collection of seeds, 80 varieties, right? Because we want your nutrition to be good. That means that some of those seeds are more fragile than others, your lettuces and so forth. They don't like to be frozen. The water that's in, the moisture and water that's in the hull will expand when it becomes ice, right? That's a property of what water does under very cold conditions. That cracks the hull, decreasing germination. So you don't want that to happen. So there's not a crystallization issue or anything like that? Yes, it breaks the hull, absolutely. And so therefore, we do not recommend that you freeze your seeds, absolutely. So these, that's why we say 40 degrees is the best temperature to store your seeds. Absolutely, that's what happens. Absolutely. Good, and, and so we're pretty close to... You're good. Great, you guys have any additional questions? Well, meet me at the table, and I'd love to you know, make sure that you've got the right knowledge base when it goes away you got to have the hard copies and we want to make sure you, you go home today with the right seeds so that you're confident that your food needs are going to be taken care of thanks so much great audience thank you this is